Good morning and welcome back to we're, the first Workforce Wednesday of 2022. We're happy to be back with you all this new year, a new school year. Um, so I am, my name is Harper Smith. I am the Senior Manager of the Kentucky Chamber Foundation and I help direct the Best of Business program. Uh, before we start today, I would like to thank our sponsors, the Kentucky Society for Human Resources Management or Kentucky SHRM and the Kentucky Community and Technical College System for their sponsorship of our program and their investment in helping to bring classrooms to careers. Um, in addition to our virtual live sessions, weekly e-news, critical job of the week graphics, this year we've launched a contest for students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade to participate throughout the school year. We, they invite them to download or request a printed copy of our newly released Bust to Business Coloring Book. This coloring book highlights critical Kentucky jobs in different industries, including construction, healthcare, equine and manufacturing, and more. Each month, students are invited to submit their completed coloring pages online and selected winners will be featured on social media and win a pizza party for their class. Um, this month, January, we are focusing on the construction industry and we'll have um, page six as the submission for this month. All this information, including links to turn in their submissions can be found at kychamber.com slash best to business. Um, closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar, so please use the um, Zoom uh, captions um, if you need that as well. Um, before we hear from our uh, guests, I just want to uh, say thank you again for tuning in with us, and we're excited to hear from Marine Solutions this morning. So today we'll be hearing from Marine Solutions, who's a leading global underwater construction company. I'll be watching in the chat for any questions, and we have our TPM project manager, Lori Mays, from the Kentucky Chamber team. Uh, we'll lead a time at the end for Q&A. So I'll kick it over to Anita and her team now. So if you all will uh, turn your cameras and microphones back on, we will let you all start your panel. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Anita Brubeck, and I work for one of the coolest companies I have ever heard about, um, Marine Solutions. We are a civil engineering and commercial diving firm that does underwater construction along with a lot of other things. I can't wait to tell you more about it. I'm in the marketing department and I'd like to turn it, uh, introduce you to um, a couple of, or three of the other, my coworkers here. Um, we'll start with you, Mariana. Hi, nice to meet you. And Mariana, would you tell us, uh, Mariana is in our New York office. Uh, we have offices in uh, Kentucky, New York, and Maryland. Uh, and Mariana is one of our engineer divers in New York. Ryan? Good morning, everybody. I'm Ryan Kendall. I'm uh, one of the senior project managers for Marine Solutions. Um, I am based out of the Nicholasville office in uh, I head up a bunch of the uh, construction projects for the company. Okay, thank you, Ryan. And Mason? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us all. Uh, my name is Mason Williams. I am the human resources manager here at Marine Solutions. Um, also located out of the Nicholasville office along with uh, Ryan and Anita. Um, again, thank you all for, for letting us join here today. Okay, so we're going to kick it off with a little short video to give you just a hint of what we do. Um, Okay, that was just a little clip there. We'll show you a lot more in a little bit here. But uh, so who is Marine Solutions? Well, we're a very unique company and we have a very niche market that we work in. Um, we're a civil engineering and commercial diving and construction firm. 
Mostly what we do, we inspect and repair bridges and marinas, uh, piers, terminals, anything around the water. Amy Wilkins started our company in 2007. Uh, she and her husband, Don, work for another engineering firm. And Amy was a civil engineer. Don was a commercial diver. They saw that they could blend their two areas of expertise and decided to start their own company. So Amy is the primary owner, which uh, we are considered a woman owned business. Um, that opens a lot of doors for us um, that we might not ever otherwise have gotten into. Many agencies, including the federal government, they set aside work just for small businesses or women-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses. Um, and they require that um, they set aside a business for that. Plus, they also have these bigger companies. They sometimes require them to use these smaller companies for certain parts of their project. So that gets us into a lot of places that since we're not a huge business, we would not have been able to get into. Right now, we have uh, a little over 100 employees. We're headquartered in Nicholasville, Kentucky, and we also have an office in Paducah, Kentucky, uh, as well as Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and Ohio. So what exactly do we do? Well, one, we do bridge engineering. Um, you may not think about it too often, but there are thousands and thousands of bridges in the United States. All of those bridges have to be inspected at least every two years. Uh, the bigger ones usually every year. Um, not only do um, we inspect the top side that you see, we also inspect underneath the water, the part that you don't see. Um, we, we do that and we've gotten really, really good at it. In fact, right now, we are inspecting bridges not only in the United States, but around the world. Last year, we uh, were awarded a contract by the Navy um, to inspect all their bridges around the world. Um, we're the only company that got that contract. Uh, right as right even today, we have two people in South Korea inspecting bridges there. Um, um, and so that's pretty cool that this little company in Nicholasville is doing that. Um, last year with that contract, we inspected over 350 bridges at 59 different naval facilities in 18 states and six different countries. So this little tiny business headquartered in Nicholasville is doing really big things for the Navy all over the world. And we do a lot of other cool and bridge inspections too. We uh, do a lot of work in Maryland on bridges. Um, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, if you've ever heard of that. Uh, we've done the Arlington Memorial Bridge in Washington, DC. We do, um, you'll see a lot of uh, bridges for CSX and Norfolk Southern Railroad. We inspect a lot of those. Uh, a lot of state owned bridges, uh, particularly in Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Indiana, Ohio. Um, so we do a lot of state bridges that are owned and, ma and maintained by the state. So that's, that's one of the things. So now I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, video on our bridge engineering side.
Bay, you saw a couple of really cool bridges there. One was in the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Another was the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. So um, in addition to bridges, we also do a lot of marine engineering where we inspect piers and marinas and waterfront structures. Um, if you've ever been to New York, uh, you probably notice that there's a lot of huge piers out there. Now they probably have parks or soccer fields or buildings or um, you know, big, huge things built on top of these piers. Our engineer divers go underneath of those piers and check all the piles that are holding those up. Uh, we inspect a lot of the piers and terminals on the Hudson River. We inspect piers uh, and, and waterfront structures at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and all along our inland waterways, um, terminals and things, we inspect those especially along the Ohio River. We do a lot of work along the Ohio River. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Mariana Fleming. She's our engineer diver in uh, New York. And Mariana, if you could give us a little introduction to you, how you came to be in this business, uh, some of the cool projects that you've worked on, and if you um, tell us about you. Sounds good, thank you, Anita. So like Anita said, my name is Mariana and I'm based out of our New York and New Jersey offices. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how I got into engineer diving, uh, what I studied, what trade school was like, and then I'm going to get a little bit into the differences in our niche from others, which Anita covered beautifully. And I'm going to talk about some of the projects that I really enjoyed working on. So I went to college up here in New Jersey. I went to Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken and I studied civil engineering. So if you don't know what civil engineering is already, it's anything that has to do with building any kind of structure. So that includes bridges, which Marine Solution does a lot of bridge engineering, but civil engineering in general includes things like tunnels, sewer systems, site design, skyscrapers, any kind of infrastructure is underneath the big umbrella of civil engineering. So I went to school to study how to create those structures. So if you've ever been interested in architecture, a lot more people are a little bit more familiar with that. That focuses a little bit more on the aesthetics and making things look pleasant, whereas the engineering kind of focuses in more on the math and how it's gonna stand up. So specifically within civil engineering, the niche that I'm in is within waterfront structural engineering. So I don't work with any kind of buildings that are, you know, inland, we call it inland engineering. So no skyscrapers, nothing like that. Nothing offshore like the oil rigs, just strictly on the waterfront. So anything along rivers and lakes for those of you in Kentucky, uh, for us, I do a lot of work in New York Harbor. So that's on the Hudson River, a lot on the East River, uh, North River, uh, some on along the inlets and then the Atlantic Ocean as well. So the kind of structures that I look at up here, I look at a lot of different bulkheads. I look at marinas, uh, big shipping terminals, uh, a lot of those things in New York Harbor where things come in from overseas, the shipping birds, those are the kind of things that we look at. So after I graduated from Stevens within civil engineering, I started with Marine Solutions and they sent me to trade school to get my commercial diving certificate, my ADCI card. I'm sure Ryan Kendall will talk more about uh, the commercial diving side of it when you hear from him. So I won't go too into that. I'm gonna focus more on the engineering. <clears throat> so I have responsibilities both in the office and the field as an engineer and a diver. So on the office side of things, I'll do things like reporting on structures that we've looked at, uh, designing repairs to different structures, designing new structures and analyzing structures. So the timeline of the projects that we'll typically follow is we'll get our contract and we'll start by going out and inspecting it. So that's where all the diving pieces of it comes in, at least on my end. So we'll go and we'll do everything above the water of the structure. And then we'll get all geared up in our hat. You saw some of that in the videos that Anita was showing you. And we'll go underneath the structure and look at what's going on under there. And then from there, we're able to take that data back to the office and analyze it to make sure that the structure is still able to support the load that it's designed to support. Because after a while, things deteriorate, 
and you don't want to end up overloading your structure and causing more damage or some kind of a failure to it. So once that is done being analyzed, we'll put all that together into a report and we're able to make recommendations to our client, whether that's like government entity or a private client or something like that, and tell them what they should do next. So we'll make recommendations to either uh, like repair the structure or say the structure is okay or some spot repairs, some overall repairs, different things like that. So in the field, more so what we're looking to do is assess and collect that data. And then on the office side, we're analyzing it. Uh, some of my favorite projects that I've got to work on, uh, I'm gonna talk about three. So if you've ever had the opportunity to visit New York, you may have visited the Statue of Liberty. The wharf that the ferries leave from to go visit there is called Battery Wharf. Uh, we had the opportunity to inspect all of Battery Wharf last winter, uh, which was really great. And we're currently designing some repairs for that structure now. Uh, I really liked that project because it was in the winter and winter diving is really special, uh, nice and comfortable, believe it or not. And I also really liked that project because the visibility was a little bit tough. Uh, it's not like, you know, the scuba diving videos you see where you see the scuba divers go under and there's all these nice videos and you can see for, you know, hundreds of feet. Uh, we usually up here in the Hudson River, or the East River, have maybe anywhere from a foot to five feet, depending on where we are. So that was really challenging in that way. And I really enjoyed that diving. Uh, we also got to inspect this summer uh, Port Newark, another one of my favorite projects. And I really liked that because it was these really, really big wharf structures with thousands and thousands of piles and each one was built differently. So the inspecting was really challenging on that and the reporting was really challenging on that as well. And I also enjoyed that structure because any of the big cargo ships that come into New York Harbor are berthed over in that area for the most part. So all of our shipping is done out of there and that was really special to be able to look at that structure. And then something a little bit different, my other favorite project is upstate in New York in an area called Ashokan. There's a huge reservoir up there. Uh, I think one of the biggest ones in New York state. And that's the start of the New York water system. Uh, New York is famous for its water. It's one of the best in the whole country and it tastes really good. And we had the opportunity to inspect a lot of the aqueducts up there. And recently we went up to dive some of the effluence chambers in the dam, which is just a way of saying, uh, it's making sure that nothing except water is coming through those aqueducts. It's catching all the timber debris, uh, making sure none of the fish get through, uh, things like that. So we got to dive that. And that was also really special because it was my deepest career dive at 92 feet deep. Um, so lots of other exciting work coming up. Uh, I've been diving for about two years and this is just a, a little bit of some of the things that I've been exposed to in that short time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Anita. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Mariana. That was very cool. So thank you. So you heard Mariana talk about uh, designing, you know, that she inspects things and finds issues with them and then designs some of the repairs. So what happens whenever she finds these problems and they need to be fixed? Well, that's where our commercial diving team comes in. Um, Ryan and his team, they go underwater, they fix things, they build things. Uh, they do construction just like you've seen welding and cutting and all of that, but they do it underwater. So um, they go in, they repair dams and bridges and piers and docks. Um, if any of you all have ever been to Harrington Lake, you might have crossed over the new Kennedy Bridge that was built a couple years ago. Our team, uh, they set the anchors and the piers for underneath of the to hold that bridge up. So, and they were working in water almost 200 feet deep, which is extremely deep. Uh, and maybe Ryan can talk about when they go down that deep, what they have to do when they come back up. Um, and sometimes um, like dams, they get cracks in them. You've, you've heard about, you know, the dams might burst or something. Well, we go in and fix those cracks in those dams so that they don't burst. Um, Along our rivers, um, there are a lot of barges hauling coal and, uh, and grain and other things. 
those barges, sometimes they get loose and they'll hit a bridge or a mooring pier and damage them. Our team goes in and we fix those. Um, after big floods and hurricanes, we do a lot of scour repair. And that just means that what, the, what is holding up the piers, uh, it kind of erodes underneath the, the bridges and stuff. So we go in and fix that so that it's not eroded. Now we have a short commercial diving video that we'll show you. So you saw just a little glimpse of some underwater welding and I think there was some drilling under there. So um, whatever you can do topside, you can do underwater as well, but it takes a little special equipment and stuff to do that. So with that, we're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan, let him introduce you, give you a little bit about his background, how he got into this business, what he does underwater and, and uh, take it away, Ryan. Thanks, Anita. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ryan Kendall, as Anita uh, said and introduced me a little bit earlier. Um, I have been diving since 2003. I have a, a slightly different background than uh, Mariana does. I didn't do any college. Uh, the, the college life was not uh, was not exactly in the cards for me. Uh, I was more of the construction worker type, which, which uh, is really a, a good focus for a lot of you out there. Um, I went uh, straight to uh, technical school out of college or out of high school and uh, graduated from dive school in 2003, like I said, um, and uh, with great aspirations to go and do a bunch of different, uh, different, different types of diving. Um, I initially started out down in the Gulf of Mexico working in on the oil rigs, um, doing a bunch of inspections and repairs. Um, hurricane damage, things of that nature, making sure that everybody is getting oil when they need oil and, and uh, getting to see that lifestyle out there. I then transferred inland. Uh, so, so commercial diving is, is kind of broken up into a couple of different sectors. Uh, the biggest broad scope is offshore, Gulf of Mexico, inland, anything uh, in the rivers and the lakes and, and places like that. So I then became an inland diver and uh, went to work for a company that did a lot of nuclear power plant work um, and uh, became a nuclear welder, underwater welder inside nuclear power plants and inside nuclear reactors, which was a pretty cool experience. Um, and then from there, transferred around, uh, did a bunch of different jobs throughout the country and then ended up here at Marine Solutions in 2009. So I've been here for quite a while. Um, Came in as a, as a dive supervisor, worked my way up to uh, where I am today, which is a senior project manager for the construction side of the company. And uh, we focus on, like Anita was saying, we do a lot of, of repairs on dams, a lot of repairs on bridges. Um, in Kentucky area here, we've got a lot of coal power plants that are still active. There's also a bunch of coal power plants that are now being decommissioned. Uh, so we've kind of transferred some of our, our workload over to the demolition and removal of those power plants, uh, which is some pretty cool work. We get to do a lot of welding, a lot of burning, uh, which is cutting, cutting steel underwater, um, things of that nature. And uh, 
so I've got a I've got a pretty good uh, pretty good broad scope of uh, experience within the, the commercial diving world in the almost twenty years that I've been doing this. Um, here at Marine Solutions, we do a little bit of everything, um, and uh, like uh, like they were mentioning the deeper stuff that we do, we, we tend to stay a little bit shallower on the inland world. We do uh, like 60 foot of water or shallower is kind of our basic um, area of work for the rivers and the lakes that are around here. Every once in a while, we do get some deeper stuff. Um, so we have the capabilities to do those deeper dives and there's there's multiple different types of, of diving. When you start talking about that, you've got um, mixed gas diving, which is where you are changing the uh, breathing media instead of just breathing air like you're breathing right now. We actually change some of that up and add a helium mixture into that, that mixture. Um, we've also got nitrox diving that allows us to stay a little bit deeper in the water for a little bit longer of time, depending on where you're at. Uh, so there's a bunch of different different types of diving that we do here at Marine Solutions. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a quite the trip for me. I, I think it's been a fantastic career choice for me. It's been, it's been, uh, it's allowed me to travel the world, uh, see a bunch of places and a lot of things that, that most people uh, on the planet aren't able to see. Um, and I've gotten paid pretty well to do it. So, um, about it for the construction side. Thank you, Ryan. Um, it, can I ask you, uh, when we do those deeper dives, uh, we have, you have to come up slowly for that. Can you tell us a little bit about that and then the decompression chambers? That's kind of an interesting uh, topic that most people don't know about usually. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, when it, depending on on how deep you go uh, in the water, it's uh, it puts you on a certain table and schedule that has been been set uh, by the U.S. Navy. They've been they've been using people as guinea pigs for a long time to figure out what diving and pressure and nitrogen does to the human body and and the physics behind all of that. Um, so depending on where you've been in the water column. There is uh, there's in water decompression that may need to happen, which means that there's there's elevations in the water as you come up. For example, if you're diving at 100 feet and you go for 100 minutes or so, and I'm and I don't have the tables in front of me, unfortunately, but um, there are certain depths that you would need to stop at for a certain period of time to allow the nitrogen that's built up into your system while doing that dive to make its way out of your body naturally just by inhaling and exhaling. Um, and there's, it's, it's four different elevations, different times and different depths that you would need to do that. There's also what we call surface decompression, SERDIO2 diving, which means that you go down to whatever working depth that you were at, stay there, do your project, do whatever it is that you were required to do, come up, you actually leave the water, you have a, a set period of time between when you leave the last stop in the water until you actually have to climb into a chamber, a hyperbaric chamber, um, that then presses you back down. So it creates the same pressure on your body as if you were in the water, but you're dry, you are controlled and you're you're being uh, monitored by personnel up on top of the, usually it's on a barge, on a boat, something of that nature. Um, and that also allows us to, to give you 100% oxygen, which helps push that nitrogen out of your system and allows you to come back to where you would be on the surface normally um, in a safe, controlled way. And it's much, much warmer and much, uh, much safer in a uh, in, in, uh, much better way to go when you start talking about doing decompression in the water. If there's any kind of a issue that happens while you're in the water on a decompression stop, there isn't a whole lot that anybody up top can do for you while you're in there. Whereas if you're doing surface decompression up in a chamber, then 
we can actually aid you if there is some type of medical issue that needs to be taken care of. So um, it's a pretty cool system. It's uh, it's 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 really in depth. It's very difficult to to go over it. That's a very broad scope, uh, broad brush of what decompression diving is. But that is uh, one type of diving that we do do here. And Ryan, I noticed that in the background there, you have a couple of hats back there. I've lifted one of those hats. They are pretty heavy. So you're putting those on your head there. Can you tell us a little about those? Sure. So um, we in the commercial diving field, as opposed to scuba diving, so scuba is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. That's where you've got a tank on your back, usually a regulator in your mouth. Uh, your head is wet. You've got goggles on. That's it's, uh, what scuba is. Commercially, we get all of our air supplied from the surface. We have a compressor that's running the entire time. And it's coming down through an umbilical, which is a, a, a bunch of different hoses that comes down to the person that's in the water um, that contains your breathing air. That's your communications uh, to the surface. So we can talk the entire time that we're underwater. Uh, your, your head, it's, it's basically, as you can see, it looks kind of like a motorcycle helmet. Um, these weigh any, roughly 32 pounds. Um, which sounds like it's really heavy. It is really heavy on the surface. When you put this on your head and you're standing around waiting to get in the water, this is a very heavy piece of equipment and it's only a portion of it. You've got this 32 pounds on you. You've got a, a tank that's on your back that we call a bailout bottle. That's uh, just in case everything was to go wrong, you still have a, surf, a supply of air that you personally control while in the water that's on your back. That's roughly another 10 pounds worth of equipment, weight belts, um, and then uh, usually some version of like an ankle weight or something of that nature. So you've got a lot of weight on you in order to keep you down in the water. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of our dive helmets. This is made by Kirby Morgan. They pretty much have the markets uh, locked in the commercial diving world for uh, helmets. There is a, there's a bunch of different types of helmets that are out there. Um, this one happens to be stainless steel, um, and essentially it's a scuba regulator that's built into a motorcycle helmet. It's kind of the best way that I can describe them. So this is a demand regulator. You can put it on, communicate while you're in there. It gives you air when you breathe, um, and then uh, when you exhale, it comes out of the helmet, goes up to the surface. Um, but this is what we wear on, on uh, all of the dives that we do. Uh, there is a very small portion that we do with scuba diving, but for the most part, everything that we do uh, is hard hat diving. It gives you some added protection as well. So um, any, other, any other questions? Thank you, Ryan. That's great. Uh, real quickly now, we're going to jump over to Mason who will uh, give us a little uh, information on education requirements and salary ranges for these particular types of jobs. Thanks, Anita. Um, so on both sides of this uh, equation here with our company, um, we have diving right on, on the engineering and the, the commercial well, the construction side. Um, both of these career paths can be extremely lucrative, uh, depending on where you are uh, with your schooling. If you're someone who likes to go to school and wants to continue on that career path or that education path, um, then the engineering side may be a really good fit for you. Uh, on, on the other side, if there's a, um, the desire to get out and use your hands and to solve problems and maybe you just don't want to go to school, um, don't want to go to college, maybe that's something you want to hold off on and explore uh, learning a trade. Uh, commercial diving is an extremely, extremely good field to get into. Uh, the next, uh, they're projecting through 2029, a 5% uh, increase in the amount of jobs available, which is higher than the, the average um, career field. Um, while I'm talking about the commercial diving side of it, uh, the, the mean, the average um, wages across the country, and this is dependent on a couple of factors, uh, including uh, what type of work you're doing, um, is it offshore? Is it inland? Um, 
who are the clients, you know, if it's a prevailing wage job, it's going to pay more uh, as opposed to some private clients, um, who, the, who the employer is, and then obviously the experience and, and, and skill set that, that you have. But um, on average, um, commercial divers, just as a very base wage, uh, are making, you know, starting, uh, or, or I'm sorry, as a mean, the average are about 50, 55 to $65,000 a year. Okay. Um, there is a significant bump as you continue to go up the uh, the career ladder there. So, you know, as Ryan mentioned earlier, he came into Marine Solutions as a dive supervisor. Um, the way that it works is there is a commercial diver, then a senior commercial diver. Um, then we have a dive supervisor, senior dive supervisor, project manager. Uh, and then Ryan's over there. He's kind of at the top of that career path. He's a senior project manager. So, uh, that's kind of what you're what you're hoping to obtain if that's what you're wanting to do. You know, not everyone wants to be uh, managing jobs and, and in the office. Um, that kind of does similar to what Mariana was saying earlier, like she has a role in the field as well as in the office. Um, but as Ryan said, you know, there's a, a, a good living to be made there. Um, again, traveling the world, you know, you kind of work as much as you want. There's plenty of work to be had. Uh, as a niche industry that we are, you know, there aren't a ton of divers out there um, and there aren't a ton of, of good divers out there. So if you're good at what you're doing, and this is kind of a universal, if you're good at what you're doing, um, there are plenty of opportunities out there. Um, now, conversely, on the other side, the engineering side, um, again, that generally, uh, here in Kentucky anyways, the average in civil engineer is makes about $84,000, okay? That of course is not a starting wage. That's also going to be somewhere in the fifty-five to sixty-five thousand dollar range, generally speaking. Um, can be a little bit lower, can be a little bit higher, depending on the market that you're in. Um, but there's also a, a nice career path there: um, project engineer to senior project engineer, um, up to project management. Uh, we have project manager positions as well, as do all the other um, competitors and whatnot. Um, and that is also an extremely lucrative career if, if, if you go down that path. Uh, again, some of it depends on where you want to be. Where's your sweet spot? Do you want to be someone who is um, boots on the ground, making things happen um, on, the, on the job sites? Or do you want to be someone who's behind the scenes making moves to help to contribute to getting those things, uh, those projects completed? And there's so many different paths and avenues. Um, and, and one thing I would encourage everybody is that, even if commercial diving and, and civil engineering isn't your path, um, there are so many different unique um, trades that uh, you may not be thinking of that, that, you know, a lot of us, when we were in high school, we didn't think to, Hey, is commercial diving a, a viable option? Never thought about it. Right. Um, hopefully this helps you guys and, and you get exposed and understand that there are so many other things out there outside of just the, um, whatever your parents are telling you. <laughs> um, and so, we would, we would definitely entertain, uh, want you to entertain some of those options. Um, so, any do you have any other questions or anything? No, uh, just one real quick thing. Um, we mm -hmm. have to emphasize that safety is the number one priority here. When you're underwater, there is no room for error there. Um, and we take our safety extremely serious here. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to get into it right now, but I think You'll be, uh, everyone on this call will be sent a video showing kind of our, our day in the life of what happens there. And um, you can watch that at your leisure there, but uh, it'll emphasize uh, the safety aspect of this, of our company as well. And I'll turn it back over to Zach and Lori. Yes, thank you so much. That was such an interesting presentation. I know very, very little about your industry um, because I actually know Ryan personally. And so I've heard all of the really neat points of your industry. Um, one of the things, because a lot of people, um, like Mason said, don't have a lot of information about what you guys do or companies like yours do. How does somebody get started in this industry? I know that Ryan and Mariana took kind of a different path in how they um, are working for your company, but if someone wants to learn more information about either commercial or inspection diving or marine solutions or um, an industry 
or business like yours, where do they go to find that information and how do they get started? Great question. So, you know, funny thing is, is a lot of times when we hear from people who are looking to get in the industry, uh, you know, we, we get cold calls every once in a while from someone, Hey, I'm interested in underwater welding. Right. Um, and that's what a lot of people kind of tie it to. Uh, and so their initial interest is a lot of times with someone who's in a trade school, they're in a welding school, for instance, and they're going, well, Hey, I talked to somebody who said there's, you know, underwater welding and, and then they get into it and they explore it. And then they, they link up with a, one of the dive schools. There are several dive schools throughout the country. Um, Ryan went to one that's in, in, um, in Washington state. Mariana went to one that's in Minnesota. Uh, there's, there's several down in Florida, California, they're all over the country. Um, and so, you know, reaching out to those schools, gaining some, some knowledge from, from them, like how much does it cost? You know, there is, I mean, dive school is not cheap. It is an investment for someone. You are investing in yourself if you'd make that decision to go that route. Um, but, you know, reaching out to, you know, a company like us, asking some questions, what do they need to know? What do they need to avoid? Um, what are the, some of the pitfalls if you go down the wrong path, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, just meeting and meeting people within the industry, you know, we're, we're happy to entertain um, questions and things like that, not just during forums like this, but, you know, any time of the year, if somebody has a question, uh, we would be happy to, to jump all over that and to, you know, to help inform more people about this industry so that they can make that, that decision of, is this something that they want to uh, get involved in? On that note, do you guys at Marine Solutions offer any kind of internships or job shattering or something that a, a current high school student could get involved in to learn more to see if that's an avenue they want to pursue? Well, we, we have had some, some high school interns uh, previously. It is tough for us to get them out on the jobs um, for liability reasons. Clients, you know, they, they, don't, they don't allow minors generally on their, on their job sites. Uh, but we, we have had some minor, some high school students that have come in uh, and worked in our shop and they get exposed to what's going on. They start to learn about, you know, the equipment, the boats, you know, how things operate. Um, and then, you know, we actually have one right now that was in high school, he's graduated, and now he's about to go to dive school. Um, it was enough for him to see what he needed to see that he decided this is the career for him. So, yeah. Great. And we had a question in the chat um, from an attendee who was at Southside Technical Center here in the Lexington area and asked um, how they can better prepare their students to make them successful for marine solutions. Um, they strongly prioritize safety first and are, are currently teaching, and I'm gonna butcher all of these, but um, SMAW, GMAW, FCAW, GTAW, and Oxifuel. So how is the best way or what can they change about their program that would um, be able to teach to, to go specifically into this career field if that was their choice? I'd have to kick that over to Ryan. Sorry, buddy. That's all right. Not a problem. Um, so for commercial diving, when it comes to underwater welding, um, the, the best way to prepare somebody that wants to be an underwater welder is uh, it's, we do all stick welding. We don't, there's no ability to do any kind of wire feed or any of that. Uh, everything that we do is stick. Um, so if you focus on that, um, we, we do some changes in order to put that, uh, that tooling into the water, but uh, that, and then, you know, and all of the things that, that, that are being taught within the trade schools for, um, for fabrication are all wonderful, uh, wonderful tools that we utilize pre-process. Uh, you know, we do a lot of the, the fabrication here in our shop beforehand, where we put all those other processes to use here in, in the shop. Um, a lot, we do a lot of, of plasma cutting, a lot of burning, um, all of those things. So it's, unfortunately there's, there's, not a great way to teach somebody or really prepare somebody to do underwater welding besides putting them in a helmet, giving them a welding stinger and a rod and showing them how to do it in that type of environment because uh, it changes things up quite a bit. But um, you know, everybody that we have brought in that had a fabrication background that did do a college type um, type classroom stuff. They, they come out with a, with a great background that we've been able to, to build off of as the, the base building block. So 
I, I would say continue to focus on the safety side of it and then just keep doing what you guys are doing and send them to us knowing that what they learn is just going to be a, a, a portion of how we operate here uh, at Marine Solutions and commercial diving as a general. Great, thanks. And I know we're kind of bumping up on time, but I have one more quick question. We could go on forever. Mariana, I'm going to throw this over to you. And this is an assumption that I have, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that this it seems to be more of a male-dominated type of industry, especially when you are um, actually under the water, doing underwater diving in either of those sectors. Can you tell us very briefly what it was like for your experience to be a woman and what it may be different uh, for being a female going into this type of career path? Absolutely. So engineering in general is a very male dominated field. So there's like that part of it that's male dominated. And then the diving is also really male dominated. So when you combine the two, uh, there's even fewer women that do both. So as far as like what can be different, the actual mechanics of the job are all the same. Like there's nothing that I wear or I do differently than what Ryan would wear. Uh, the only big difference is that all my equipment is smaller. So I'm like five foot seven, but I'm really little in the shoulders. So I've had like some trouble finding equipment that fits me. Uh, that's not like too big because then it could be a safety concern just because then things could slip off or... Um, if I'm not comfortable, then it's a distraction or it can get caught on things underwater. So that's been a little bit different for me. And then making sure that you have uh, like the muscle just to be able to throw all the equipment around and do everything that everybody else can do. So I found that putting in more time to develop like that piece of me was really, really helpful. Um, everybody that I've worked with, uh, especially at Marine Solutions has been really awesome. Like I've worked in different types of civil engineering industries where uh, it wasn't like as inclusive, uh, but here I've always had a great experience, always been really wonderful. Um, the guys on site are like not phased at all by it. They're like, you can do what I do. That's really great. And that's been, been really nice to, to have here. So I feel pretty lucky in that, but definitely that's not the case everywhere. <laughs> well, thanks for that insight. And, you know, everything we've heard, I know that Marine Solutions is involved in a program that the Community Chamber does called Best Places to Work. And you guys all always rank very highly as an amazing company to work for. And you guys have proven that again during this presentation. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, Harper, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, I think we're kicking it back over to KCTCS. So thank you guys very much for participating. Yes, thank you all so much. That was such a great panel. And I know I learned a lot about this field and this um, company. So thank you all again for uh, your participation. And I will now kick it over to um, ACTC from KCTCS uh, System and uh, I think Dr. Larry Ferguson. So um, I know you had a presentation and Ashley, I believe, too. So hopefully you all can pull that up. If not, we've got it. So but I'll kick it over to you all for your portion now. Thank you, Harper. Um, as Harper said, I'm Larry Ferguson. I'm the president of Ashland Community and Technical College. And it was exciting to hear all of the things related to the presentation we just saw in regards to technical training. We've been here since 1938, and we provide a lot of certificate, diploma, and associate degree programs and help students who want to transfer on to baccalaureate programs. I will say to folks who are watching this, many of our programs can be completed in six weeks or less. So as Ryan talked about, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to college uh, for a two year period of time or a four year period of time. Uh, we are a member of the Kentucky Community and Technical College System. So if you're watching this outside of Northeast Kentucky, rest assured there are 15 other KCTCS colleges strategically located across the state with similar programs as the one that we are going to uh, preview to you today. Uh, to get started, a little background, uh, back in 2017, Unity Aluminum announced a $1.7 billion aluminum rolling mill plant project for this area of the state. And this created an immediate demand for highly skilled, technologically trained workers that we hadn't seen in Northeast Kentucky previously, with the exception of the workforce demands of Marathon Refining, which is actually located here. So ACTC created the Advanced Integrated Technologies Program, which you're going to hear about, uh, to meet this workforce need. We did so in record time. 
So don't let folks say that higher education can't respond quickly and be agile when needed. And our first cohort of students graduated in 2021. Uh, due to the unique design of this program, it's generated a lot of interest, uh, interest in the media from CNN, the New York Times, the Courier Journal, and many others, so you may have heard about it. But this morning, you'll learn more about what we call AIT, Advanced Integrated Technologies, from the man who helped create it, Program Coordinator Mike Tackett. You'll also hear from Ashley Vanderpool on our team, who leads our ACTC Career Services Unit, this specialized unit offers a range of resources and events to help you choose a career, find a job, and develop skills for lifelong success. So without hesitation, I'm going to pass it over to Mike Tackett, who's the coordinator of our AIT program. Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. I don't think I have uh, my camera working yet. There we go. Can everybody see me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Just uh, want to make sure I haven't used Zoom much. Uh, but anyways, my name is Michael Tackett. I'm the program coordinator here at Ashland Community Technical College, uh, associate professor. And um, uh, my background is I'm from industry. I've only been teaching at the college uh, for about seven years. Uh, came up through the trades as an electrical, uh, uh, industrial electrician. I uh, went through a five-year apprenticeship program. Uh, also went through the electrical program back in the day, the vocational school two-year program. And then switched and went to ACC at the time and got a two-year associate degree. So I'm really excited that ACTC has combined both uh, uh, the technical trades, uh, the gen ed, the academic side, because I think it makes for so much better of a well-rounded uh, student. Uh, to, to have a better career success in industry. Um, a little bit about the AIT program, what is it? Uh, AIT teaches a broad-based set of technical skills. Uh, it includes very sophisticated components and systems like PLCs, Programs for Logic Controllers, uh, what we call BFDs, because no one ever says the full name, but it's uh, variable frequency drives. Uh, we teach instrumentation, robotics. Uh, we teach uh, just basic electrical ACDC systems. Uh, hydraulics, pneumatics, uh, all the different systems it takes to run a modern day facility. And as the name implies, integrated technology, we focus and make sure the students understand all these different components, all these different systems come together. Every piece of equipment utilizes multiple of these items and systems. Uh, so uh, we make sure they're prepared and give the industry the skilled workforce they need to make the school work uh, successful. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Ash Ashley's taking a couple of slides for me. Ashley, the next slide. Um, so uh, I'm very proud of the program. I, it was so exciting, such a great chapter in my life when the college approached and said, hey, uh, uh, help develop a program here that's going to help this new industry come into town or any industry uh, have the skilled workforce they need. And uh, so I was able to use both my background in the technical trades uh, also owned a company, so I was a supervisor, administrator. Uh, my company would work in plants all around the tri-state area uh, and also did medical facilities and so forth. So uh, I got to see how the different plants uh, train the people, uh, how, how did their technicians, how does everything come together. And I got to see it from, uh, as I was a contract, got to move around, so really interesting. And uh, just really think it helped prepare me. Uh, for the past of the college game to create the program here at this campus. Um, so besides the technical skills that you see on the slide, uh, I really feel the three major pillars of teamwork and critical thinking along with the technical skills. Um, so besides, of course, teaching the technical skills, even trainer, educational trainers, and other resources to do that, uh, we focus on teamwork. Um, and I think anybody uh, that has been uh, in, in the been employed or in the, and well on the career, realizes how important that is. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, from day one, uh, any task, any homework assigned that the students given, they're always paired together, at, they're paired in minimum or in small groups. Uh, so they're constantly working together. I have a little fun, I'll give out cards uh, to where randomly uh, fate will decide who they're gonna work with. They don't get to work with their just a favorite buddy all the time because they don't learn how to work with people with different backgrounds and different personalities. 
so that that is constant throughout the program. Every semester, uh, at the end of the semester, we get evaluation sheets where the students will fill out how did their peers work in the groups and also to evaluate themselves. And then I give feedback to the students on, hey, here's what you need to work on. Here's, uh, here's some things that will help you improve your dynamics and teamwork. So I uh, really love that aspect. And then the third one's critical thinking. Um, uh, anytime I mention the industry, how the program focuses on critical thinking, just eyes get big as saucers. They love that concept because they know how critical it is. You can never train somebody. You can train and train and train them. But if they don't take some of the fundamentals, every project, every assignment, everything they do is different. So you've got a whole those critical thinking skills where they can take the fundamental training they got and then work in the field because there's constant variables. Uh, so critical thinking is paramount. How do we do that in AIP? Um, I really thought that through. So I bought trainers, uh, or how we focus on is troubleshooting. Uh, so I bought trainers that teach the fundamentals, but then after the students learn the fundamentals on the basic trainers, we have literally trainers built from troubleshooting trainers. And uh, so now they take those skills and sit down, let's say at a motor control board, they learn the basics, well, now a computer with this educational trainer that we have will make independent components better. And the student has to, uh, due to our troubleshooting techniques we teach them, use multimeters, uh, hydraulic gauges, depending on what system they're on, and then troubleshoot to figure out what's wrong. So they're honing the critical thinking skill when they're troubleshooting. And definitely by the second, third, and fourth semesters, they're doing a lot of that. And it's amazing to watch uh, a student learn the basics and uh, be on a trainer to learn, uh, say, how to wire up another board and what the components do. But then their skill level goes through the roof once they have to apply those to the critical thinking and troubleshooting the system That's when they really have to understand how the system works. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, next, and, and probably last, I'll say, is the uh, uh, AIT Facebook group page we made. I'm very proud of that. I wanted to stay in touch. Uh, with uh, students once they graduate. So we create an AIT alumni Facebook page. It's a private group. Uh, so only uh, instructors in the school, uh, students who have either graduated or in the program, and of course our career service folks or specific industry partners uh, that, that are relevant to be in it, that we have in it. Uh, the main focus is you know, career services for myself are reached uh, from industry and they say, hey, we got a job opportunity to think would be great for an AIT student. And then we post it on the uh, Facebook group page so our students can easily access uh, those up there for employment opportunities. Uh, on top of that, uh, any student, I encourage them if they get a job once they graduate, that they post on AIT Facebook uh, uh, that they got the job so everybody can graduate them. I really think it motivates the students, one that haven't gotten the job yet, and it even motivates our students that are still in the program that they're seeing the success of the graduates. So uh, it's just a fantastic uh, uh, teamwork building and, and stay connected long term with the students. Uh, thirdly, what I have been phenomenal and I have encourage the students to do, if they go out and get a position in industry and uh, then they find out, hey, now they're there and they find out there's other job opportunities that would fit an AIP student, I encourage them to pass that information along and let the other students know, hey, there's a position over here. And then even they can link with the students and, and directly amongst each other and say, hey, when I went through the hiring process, here's what it was like. So just let the students get a little more acclimated if they decide to follow on the same career path at the same facility. Um, lastly, we have had phenomenal success. I've been so proud. As Dr. Ferguson mentioned, we first started the program here uh, to help uh, support a, a plant that was planning on building here. Uh, so far to date, they haven't been had the opportunity to build. But uh, so when our students graduated, they weren't, of course, fit to the mill that got built. But they, as I promised students, I said, what we're teaching you here, you can take anywhere. You're going to be a very valuable commodity. And uh, boy, was I proven right. Our students have had tremendous employment success. Uh, some of our students, a lot of times, you go to work for a company, you have to take some type of technical test just to make sure you have some uh, fundamentals and the basics down. Uh, our students, one student uh, in the company history got the high score, so uh, you can imagine how elated I was from that. Uh, but we've had just tremendous success, and what is also exciting is 
as our students, again, they've learned all the fundamentals every industry needs. And it's proven when they've gone out. I've had students been to nuclear power plants, chemical plants, refineries, uh, plastic plants, metallurgy plants. Uh, they've not only gone on to be technicians, but also the operators. Uh, so again, usually there's maintenance and operations from the plant. And uh, so the, the companies have been finding value in moving the student to operate the equipment, run the facility, because they have an in-depth background in, in the how all those components work so it makes them better in operations. Um, but other than that, guys, I appreciate your time today. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, please reach out to me if there's any other questions I can answer in the future. Uh, I'd be glad to provide them. Hopefully, we'll get our email address maybe sent out to everybody. I uh, would love to talk to anybody. Other than that, I'll turn it over to Ashley Vanderpool with uh, Career Services. Hey, Ashley, I think you are on mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, thanks. Okay. I think that's the famous term since COVID has begun, right? On these virtual meetings, can you hear me now? But my name is Ashley Vanderpool, and I work in the Career Services Department here at Ashland Community and Technical College. I want to thank both uh, Mike Tackett and Dr. Ferguson for introducing us and participating today. Um, First, I want to start by saying that career services is something that's definitely dear to my heart, mainly because I found my own career path in college by visiting the career services department that we had on campus. And after going through a lot of career assessments and um, participating in different internships, I finally decided what I wanted to do. So I actually entered college as an undecided student and without um, the work and assistance with career services at college, I probably wouldn't have completed. So I've seen firsthand um, the work that we do and the, and the value of the services that we provide to students. Um, so what is career services? I think I hear this a lot when I go to different classroom presentations, um, especially when students are first entering college, they have no idea what our services are and what we offer. So I always start by telling students that my job is to essentially find them a job. And I think that's something that we do pretty well. We assist students with pretty much every aspect of their career path from beginning with assisting them with teaching them what a resume is, how to complete one, and then we work with them alongside with them um, through their entire career journey, whether that be participating in a mock interview or applying for a job, or even if they get a call for an, an interview and they're a little nervous, we help with mock interview skills. And you'll see that on our next slide, this just kind of goes over a few of the services that we offer. Um, a few of the larger ones that we um, assist most of our programs with would be, of course, classroom presentations. This is where we enter classrooms. We talk about resume building skills. We talk about interview skills, some of the soft skills um, as well so that they're successful after they um, obtain a job. We also do individual student appointments. This is where students enter our office. We see tons of students each semester and, and each day for that. And we help them with the resume and different needs. I always say that every day in career service is a little different. You really never know what a student's gonna um, to need when they stop by our, our office. We also um, provide students with a handshake platform and that's free um, to any of our students and alumni members. This is a platform that helps students search for jobs and internships, both locally, um, but also at a national level. Um, we every semester we conduct a job and internship fair, and this is where we bring um, local employers or even um, some employers that aren't local um, to set up tables. Students have the opportunity to walk by, see what um, opportunities they have available, and we've had tons of success for, with our um, recent job fairs. Many of our students uh, enter that fair nervous. Um, it's the first time they've actually had an opportunity to speak with an employer face by face and they leave smiling because one of them have offered them an internship or one of them encouraged them to apply for a job. So those are always great events. And then we also conduct each semester several industry led mock interviews. And this is where local employers will come to ACTC. We set up different rooms for them and we conduct mock interviews with the students. 
Okay, so our next slide just kind of goes over student successes. This is one of our big ones. This is why we do what we do. Um, if students aren't successful, then, you know, kind of what's the point of career services? But it's always rewarding to speak with students. And after they visit us the first time, they're usually a little nervous to stop by. And then by the time they finish their semester, they've landed at the career of their dreams. And this is something um, that we love to work with our different departments, including the AIT department. It's great to hear from those students. It's great to go to classrooms and speak with them about services that we provide and help them along their journey. And then if you have any questions um, regarding ACTC or our services, we have our email addresses located in these PowerPoints and then our website information on this last slide. I will stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it back over, I believe, to Zach. Thank you so much, Ashley and the ACTC team. Um, that's some great information and great resources that they provide. Um, I know we're a little over our time today, so thank you all for tuning in and for um, being a part of our Bus to Business program this week. Uh, we look forward to our next session on our next Workforce Wednesday, January 19th. So we please uh, hope that you all will tune in again. This month we're focused on construction. So hope you all will sign up to participate and participate in the uh, elementary school coloring book contest that I mentioned at the top of the hour. Thank you all very much. And I hope you all have a great rest of the week.